Thank you, Megan. Uh, we will start our city council meeting on the 7th of June at 7.01. Uh, can we have Vice Mayor Ricardo Ortiz say the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation one. under God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Megan, can we have roll call, please? Councilmember Beach? Here. Councilmember Colson? Here. Councilmember Brownrigg? Present. Vice Mayor Ortiz? Here. Mayor O'Brien? Here. Okay, on to a report out from closed session. Uh, our city attorney? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, the Burlingame City Council met in closed session on the items list on the item listed on the closed session agenda. Uh, there was no reportable action. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in regards to upcoming events, uh, I just want to remind everyone. I'm sure many people are excited that the library will be reopening on the 15th of June. Um, I know many of our constituents have missed. Uh, the ability to use our library. So I'm sure everyone is looking forward to that opening. Um, also a reminder that the Fresh Market is open on Thursdays from three to seven and also on Sundays from nine to one. We will be having a traffic and safety and parking commission meeting this, uh, this week, uh, June 10th at seven o'clock. And are there any other events that anyone would like to bring up? Okay, uh, Council Member Beach. Thank you, Madam Mayor, for mentioning the Traffic Safety Parking Commission meeting. Just for members of the public who are interested, they're going to be discussing the California Drive um, this bike facility at that meeting. So that's a great public meeting to provide input. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Beach. All right, we will go and uh, forward, and we have two presentations uh, this evening, and we are going to start with the first presentation which is the recognition of June 2021 as Pride Month. We do have a proclamation. Um, we do have two people uh, that may be speaking this evening. So what I may do is have them speak first and then I will read the uh, proclamation. So we have Juliana McCracken Garcia and Crystal uh, Casino. And let me see, are you on the call? Madam Mayor, I've moved them over to panelists. Oh, right back to panelists. Okay, let me switch over. Okay, uh, Juliana, would you like to start? Perfect. I'm actually going to turn it over to Crystal, my colleague on the LGBTQ Commission. Okay, thank you. Hi, can, can people see me, hear me? We can hear you. Oh. Perfect. Now we can okay. see you. Oh, perfect. Hey, everybody. Thank you for letting us be here. Um, thank you so much for, um, you know, letting um, June month, proclaiming that as Pride Month. My name is Crystal Cancino. And my pronouns are she, her. Thank you again, Burlingame City Council, for recognizing Pride Month this year. I'm so excited to see the city issue this proclamation to declare June as Pride Month for a second year in a row. We are honored and proud to accept this proclamation on behalf of the San Mateo County LGBTQ Commission. Our mission is to bring greater recognition and visibility to the LGBTQ community in San Mateo. For a second year in a row, our commission has invited all cities and towns in San Mateo County to formally recognize Pride Month. This visibility allows LGBTQ residents to know that they are seen, that they are important. During this time of continued social distancing due to COVID-19, these simple acts of visibility create a deeper sense of connection and inclusion for everyone in our community. By issuing this proclamation, Burlingame is visibly demonstrating how important it is for all of us to see our local government celebrate Pride Month. 
Hi, my name is Juliana Garcia. My pronouns are she and her. As an LGBTQ commissioner, I want to update the council that we've had outstanding success with our Pride Visibility Campaign this year. All 20 cities in the county are issuing a proclamation, and 19 of the 20 cities are, will be raising a Pride flag. The majority of these cities will be raising the Progress Pride flag. This most recent iteration of the rainbow flag includes black and brown stripes to represent marginalized LGBTQ plus communities of color, as well as pink, light blue, and white to represent the transgender community. The Progress Pride flag emphasizes equity and inclusion for all within the larger LGBTQ plus community. And we sincerely hope that Burlingame considers joining us and also raising the Progress Pride flag. This will be a historic step to support diversity, equity, and inclusion in Burlingame. Lastly, I invite residents of Burlingame to join the county in its virtual celebration of Pride Month, which kicked off yesterday and will go through June 12th. You can learn more by visiting smcpridecelebration.com. Thank you all so much for your time tonight. Love conquers all and happy Pride. We hope to see you guys at our events that are coming up. And again, thank you so much for your support. We appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Juliana and uh, Crystal. Um, is there anyone else actually from the public? I'm gonna ask right now before I say a couple things. Um, gonna open up to the public to see if anyone would like to make any comments. Please raise your hand if you'd like to comment, please. Madam and Mayor. Then, uh, Megan, do we have any emails? Yes, I received okay. one. All right, so I don't see anyone's hands raised, so I'm going to close that part of the public comment. And then, Megan, if you can read those emails, please. Sure. As a resident of Burlingame, I'd like to ask the city council to raise the progress flag. flag. I'm in support of joining the rest of Sing City County um, in showing our support of the right. LLU. Oh, no. Um, by standing for diversity and inclusion. I found out we are the only city not raising any flags and I'm hoping it is not too late to show our support. Thank you, Sam Gardner. Is that the only um, email, Megan? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Thanks, Megan. Um, so before I um, recognize June as Pride Month with the proclamation to both Juliana and Crystal. Um, I just wanted to let you know that we will be having a special meeting scheduled for Wednesday uh, to discuss the flag uh, raising ceremony. Um, we had to have 72 hour notice and I wanted to make sure the whole council uh, knew that this would be discussed, but it was too late to put it on for today's meeting. So um, for a special meeting, all we need is a 24 hour notice. Uh, so that will be scheduled for Wednesday at, um, and I think I need city manager to specify the time. Is it six o'clock or 545? 545? 545. 545. So I just wanted to let you know that. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. So then on that note, uh, for the proclamation, uh, whereas the city council of Burlingame recognizes and proclaims the month of June 2021 as LGBTQ Pride Month throughout the city. Whereas all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights, and LGBTQ individuals have had an immeasurable impact on the cultural, civic, and economic successes of our country. And whereas Burlingame is committed to supporting visibility, dignity, and equality, for LGBTQ people in our, in our diverse community. Whereas while society at large increasingly supports LGBTQ equality, it is, essential, it is essential to acknowledge that the need for education and awareness remains vital to end discrimination and prejudice. And this nation was founded on the principle that every individual has infinite dignity and worth and Burlingame City Council calls upon the people of this city to embrace this principle and work to eliminate prejudice for where it exists. And whereas celebrating Pride Month influences awareness and provides support and advocacy for San Mateo County's LGBTQ community and is an opportunity to take action and engage in dialogue to strengthen alliances 
build acceptance and advance equal rights. Now, therefore, I, Ann O'Brien Keegren, mayor of the city of Burlingame, in addition to my colleagues, recognize June 2021 as Pride Month in support of the LGBTQ community. So we will send this uh, to one of you. I'll have the city clerk do that. And then uh, I invite you then to attend our special meeting on Wednesday. And I'll make sure that the um, our city clerk sends you the Zoom link. Thank you All so right. much, Mayor O'Brien. Thank you. Thank you. You are quite welcome. And have a wonderful evening. And you are welcome to stay on. Next on our agenda, uh, we are going to have a presentation on the update on the off-leash dog areas. And I think we're going to have Nicole do this presentation. That, that is, is correct, correct Madam, Madam Mayor. Mayor. Can you guys, Can you guys see, my see my screen? screen? Yes. All right. All right. Let's start. Let's start. There's also a bit of background. Is that on my end? I think we'll just have everyone mute. All right, I think that works. All righty, so good evening, Madam Mayor and City Council members. This evening, I am providing an update on the off-leash options in Burlingame, specifically from the Dog Park Task Force. For over 10 years, city staff have been working on improving and expanding the off-leash leash, leash options, resulting from significant community interest. A Dog Park Task Force was established and includes two city council members, two Parks and Rec commissioners and city staff. Since 2012, we've held six formal dog park task force meetings, toured many neighboring cities dog parks and held over 30 community meetings and created a contact list with over 150 residents. The, South, the County of San Mateo Health Animal Control has also noted that in 2020, Burlingame has over 1,700 licensed dogs. Here's what we've learned so far. So there's clearly desire for additional options and hours. The dog park, or I'm sorry, the dog community is quite vocal in their desire to have options and hours throughout the city. Uh, overall, there has been an increase in park usage, um, both with two-legged friends, four-legged friends, all of the above. Uh, there's been an increased conflict with off-leash dogs and other park users, in particular the field areas. There is a need to keep park and playground users separate from off-leash areas. Uh, the city council in particular has also made note in the past with regards to fenced in areas, uh, which we have done in particular with Skyline and it's been proven to be quite great. And then there's also the concern about people picking up um, after their dogs. What we have so far uh, is for off-leash options, we have a few. We have Washington Park and Cornavaca Grass. It's open from 6 to 7.30 a.m. Monday through Friday and includes the weekends as well. So that's a weekend option. Washington and Cornavaca ball fields are open September to May, 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. It does exclude the summer hours when it specifically has to do with camps. So right now in the morning, we are letting people on um, to the grass, but when camps begin to start, they will not be able to use those ball fields. We also have the Bayside Exercise Park, which is open sunrise to sunset, additionally seven days a week as well. The most recent one, and I'm sure it's all fresh and new in you guys' mind, because last year we were, we were able to open it, is the Skyline Park. Although not a specific dog park, it does allow off-leash areas. That started in 2015. The Dog Park Task Force asked the recreation staff to research possible locations for a new off-leash area. We reviewed city-owned parcels um, as well as privately owned. In November of 2016, the Park and Rec Commission unanimously approved the concept um, and then in 2017 approved the, in June of 2017 approved the plan. And uh, Skyline Park was brought to the city council in April of 2018. And again, it was unanimously voted to proceed and allocated $400,000 in CIP funds for the project. On January 4th, 2021, uh, much to our excitement, the city council adopted the resolution for Skyline Park um, and it has been going ever since. And again, it's sunrise to sunset um, seven days a week. One of the things uh, that we've noticed in the past um, you know, year or so is what's going on now. And it's the same concerns with regards to the ones that we had in 2012. Uh, there are still, there's a desire still for more hours. There is a need to keep the playground and park users separate from the off-leash areas, including fenced in areas. There is more concern for field maintenance for park staff. And there is a concern for safety 
um, of the fields, including digging and owners not picking up after their dogs. There, I put two examples on here. They are four of many that I have received um, <laughs> quite frequently, actually. Uh, this, the examples are include dug, uh, holes being dug and the impact of the grass, um, in particular for those field users uh, when they're playing, um, say, at like Washington or Bayside. Uh, the park staff really does try to, you know, fix those holes. Weeds do come up. It does, you know, impact the quality of the field. But um, again, this is, <laughs> this is what's happening. The urine stains um, are happening. Uh, in particular, we're seeing it right now at Ray in the newly renovated field. Uh, what happens is when the dog urinates on the field, it attracts other dogs to do the same in that area. The pH, I learned a lot about this, guys. The pH becomes too acidic. Uh, in that same area, and it ends up what's called burning the grass. The grass dies and becomes just bare soil, and then it takes about a year, if completely untouched, for that soil to um, come back together from the margins around. Um, however, then what happens if it is untouched or if it's touched, then irrigation also comes and then creates mud holes, you know, just for further damaging those fields, um, and uh, the grass doesn't really have a chance to recover um, as much as we would obviously hope it would. Some of these um, are examples of Ray, the, the two with the burns. Um, and we're seeing those in particular because it's brand new grass. Um, it's, it hasn't fully you know, captured into the soil yet. It's also a level field. So whereas our other fields, you know, we see some weeds, we see those things. So the, they tend to get hit a little bit better, but Ray is currently um, experiencing you know, quite a bit of burns, which does lead us to looking ahead. The dog park task force um, is you know, continually looked for other options. Uh, one of the things that you know happened in twenty in May of twenty eighteen is the Ray Park Master Plan uh, renovation was done. In particular, like I had mentioned, because of the field, we are seeing obviously increased burn marks. So we are looking ahead, and uh, on the seventeenth of this month, we'll be presenting to the Parks and Rec Commission to see if we can um, go forward with those dog areas back in Ray. Um, you know, we are continuing to look for options that don't include ball fields. We all know there's not a lot of parcels around, but when we are able to find some, um, that, that is very helpful. So annually, we try to come and give a dog park task force update. Obviously, we didn't do it last year, but uh, what we're doing is looking this year to increase those um, areas that are specifically just going to be able to be for big dogs, small dogs, um, dogs in general. So as, as the update for the off-leash, we are, we are doing well. We are continuing to forge ahead to look at some other areas um, in particular, I wanted to put Ray Park on your guys' radar. That is where we are with the task force. I am here to answer any questions you may have. I'm going to just uh, chime in one more location. Um, there is a development um, underway at Summerhill over off Rollins Road in the new development area. Um, and uh, while um, it will be maintained by... Um, Summerhill, it is going to be a city park, and it will also have two fenced-in off-leash areas, but that's still a ways out, but it will be um, over in the Rollins Road area, so we are making good progress, um, just never as fast as everyone would like. Thank you for adding that, Margaret. Thank you, Margaret, and thank you, Nicole, for your presentation. Uh, I'll start with Council Member Brownrigg. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And so I, I will just speak on behalf of people who do uh, show up at Ray at long after hours. It is a very nice community of people. And of course it is a great shame if, if um, there are dead spots. I don't know if there's any way to address that. Uh, I mean, I, could, I think I can see which way, you know, staff is leaning on this. And I will just say that it attracts a lot of people from the neighborhood. Um, and I think people have um, in general been extremely good with one another. Um, it would be a shame if that really went hard offline to dog owners. And I, I understand the rebuttals, but I'll just speak for the people who show up at night after a long day and have a chance to relax. Um, you know, we are very aware it's a very strong community over there, and one of our goals is to give them space to do exactly what they're doing, um, and that is the goal. So the picture that Nicole had put up, 
Part of the master plan was two fenced in off leash areas. They're quite significant. They're in an area that isn't as heavily used. There's still a large area left in the park that has the big trees for imaginative play that's still there adjacent to the playground. Um, but it would be a way to allow those, um, those dog owners to use it um, without getting in trouble because there would be space for them to do it. And when the field was packed with the use of other things, that area would still be open to them also. I uh, thank you, Mary. I was just gonna actually add that is, like, is you know, by providing these other fenced in areas to Margaret's point, it will be open, you know, the uh, additional amount of time for people to be able to use. Is it big enough to throw a ball? Yes, it's quite large actually. It, it actually, the, the larger part area spans uh, the entire length of both of those tennis courts. So it's, it's actually quite large. Thank you. Councilmember Beach. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Nicole, for the presentation. Um, I guess I'm, mine is a process question. So, you know, that's sort of a, you gave us a preview of maybe what's to come as a potential proposal for a uh, fenced in dog area at Ray. But like everything, it comes with trade offs, as you said, because right now that area is used for other things imaginative play, children use it. It's, it, it, I would like to understand what's our role and when what's the process going to be for considering those additional spaces and the trade-offs, pros and cons for that? Um, and how is council involved? And at what point in the process do we get to, you know, agendize that and have more of a discussion? Thanks. Our, our process currently is we're just, we're going to present it to um, the Park and Rec Commission um, on the 17th, just as Kind of a roll through with regards to the whole Ray Park master plan now that the field's done being renovated, looking at the rest of that area, the playground was done, then the field, and then this was part of it as well. Um, Margaret could probably jump in with a better timeline. As she mentioned, these things do take a bit of time. So it would go to Park and Rec Commission, we would formulate some sort of plan, we would get bids, and then we would come to City Council. Uh, so uh, whether it goes to Council depends on the cost of the project. This um, area, the master plan was incorporated into the parks master plan that was approved by um, the commission and the council over a year ago. Um, for this specific area, um, what happens for us is we'll be noticing all the neighbors within that neighborhood. So they'll get a letter mailed to their house. Um, it gets put out to um, park users um, it'll be posted in a little A-frame so people will know that it's coming up. And we usually put something in the e-news that it'll be coming up on the agenda. So once that agenda comes out, which is usually a week before the meeting, um, all that information so people can go on the website and read the staff report. Um, I'm not sure what the estimates are for the fencing. Um, and it will depend on the cost there's to, if it, if the commission is interested in moving forward with it, um, we would have to get a more firm cost. We have a, just a general idea right now. There is some paving that would have to be done, which actually would help us with some of the ADA concerns over in that area. Cause it would tie in from one side to the other. We're, right now we're not ADA compliant. So it would um, check off a little another box on the list. Um, and then there'd be some fencing that would have to be put in and we know how long it took to get the fencing up for Primrose Park. So um, depending on the cost, it would need to come back to council if we cannot incorporate it into our existing CIP funds. Um, I don't know if it will go over that $100,000 threshold or what, how close we'll be. So that will just depend on, but, um, on the costs but the first thing we have to do is notice the neighborhoods and see if the commission is even interested in moving forward with it. Okay, thank you. So it sounds like commission approval and interest in neighbor and then council's role is more budgetary mm -hmm. at this point. Thank you. Yeah. Council member Colson. Thank you. Um, just on behalf of the hundreds of young women that use that field to play softball because that is their primary location that they play. And as one who has over the years attended to a lot of balls that bounced into holes and smacked in someone in the face or ankles or little knees that got, you know, torn or ankles that got sprained, I, I am 
sensitive to the fact that we have invested this money into a nice field. It's not turf. It's one of our only grass fields that we have. And while I think we do, you know, need to share it, um, you know, I, d I don't want to forget that this is basically one of the only places that our young um, girls are allowed to play ball. They don't play at Bayside. They don't have the opportunity really to be out there. This is it. And we've just invested a ton of money into this, this situation. Um, and I, I really wanna make sure we also balance the needs to, for, the, for the, young, the young girls and the sports that they're playing over there with the needs of the dog owners. Vice Mayor Ortiz. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And it's funny that it's all about Ray Park tonight, but uh, I was there last night. Ellie loved it. Uh, and there was a big group. I agree with Council Member Brownrigg. There is a nice community that meets there every uh, night at twilight. And um, it, I, I look forward to some solutions that can allow what Council Member uh, Colson mentioned, the uh, uh, playground for, or the playing fields for the softball and the dog park. So look forward to the solution. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, my comments are similar to Vice Mayor and Council Member Coulson. Um, Ray Park is not far from my house and um, I do have a dog. And I know that Ray Park is used heavily uh, by community members, but I also feel that there needs to be a balance, um, especially when we have spent so much money and new grass. Uh, in that area, I hate to see it ruined. Um, so if there's a way we can come to compromise where both residents can utilize it, whether it's for um, softball or um, just free play for families to go and enjoy uh, and then have fenced off areas for dogs so it's a little more controlled, I think that might work uh, a little bit better. Uh, we'd hate to see you know kids get hurt or adults get hurt uh, on, uh, you know, at Ray Park due to, you know, dogs digging holes and, and so forth. So um, I look forward to hearing a little bit more about this and it will be in front of the park and rec soon and um, want to hear their comments and, and how they would like to uh, move forward uh, with the parks in, you know, in Burlingame. I mean, we are fortunate that we have uh, a few dog parks scattered throughout the city and um, we, we definitely wanna make sure they have their space, uh, but we also wanna balance it too with community uh, needs in addition to um, dog owners. So thank you again, uh, Nicole and Margaret uh, for your presentations. You're very welcome. Have a good night, everybody. You too. Thanks. All right, we will move forward to item number seven, which is our public comments. And uh, this is a time where the members of the public can speak about any item that is uh, not on the agenda this evening. Uh, members of the public wishing to suggest an item for a future council agenda may do so during this public comment time. The Ralph M. Brown Act uh, prohibits the city council from acting on any matter that is not on the agenda. So before I open it up to public comment, I'd like to ask our city clerk, uh, Megan, do we have any emails for public comment? No, we have no emails. Okay, great, thank you. So I'm opening up to public comment. Is there anyone uh, that would like to speak during this time period? Okay, I do not see anyone. So I will close the public comment and we will move forward to our consent calendar. We have quite a few items on the consent calendar, items 8A through uh, 8M. So is there anyone from the council that would like to pull an item? Seeing no one, uh, I will open it up then to the public. Is there anyone in the public that would like to pull an item? Uh, to our city clerk, is there anyone that has sent an email that wanted to pull an item? No, there is none. All right, so then on that note, I will close public comment.
Madam Mayor, I'm so sorry. I beg your pardon. I was trying frantically to clear windows so that I could um, remind myself of um, one of these items that I, I, I beg your pardon. Um, I was thinking about the dogs. Um, uh, shoot. So many on consent. Um, I guess, I guess it's not important. I'll pass, okay. thank you, Madam Mayor. Okay, um, so on that note, is there anyone that would like to make a motion to approve items 8A through 8M? So moved. Second. So motion made by uh, Vice Mayor Ortiz, seconded by, I think it was Council Member Beach. Uh, can we have a roll call, please? Uh, Madam Mayor, may May I just make a may I make a comment on the motion very quickly? I recall, uh, and it didn't need to be pulled. Uh, so, with respect to the IT contract, um, it does remind me that I think, and I did read, and I appreciate some of the work done for cybersecurity, but I do think the issue merits a deeper dive by council to uh, make sure that we are really um, doing our best, even working through Redwood City's IT department, to ensure we have both adequate backup, frequent backup of data, and we minimize our exposure to ransomware. So um, I don't need to pull it. I just will make that comment on the motion. I've, I've commented about that before. So Ada, I just wanted to add that point given that it was an agenda item tonight. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Council Member Brownrigg. Uh, so to our city uh, clerk, can you take a um, voice vote, please? Council member Cole, sorry. Yes. Council member Colson. Yes, and I just want to note that on our audit committee, I requested just exactly what Councilman Brownrigg um, mentioned. Council member Brownrigg. Yes, and thank Vice, you. Vice Mayor Ortiz. Yes, thank you. Mayor O'Brien. Uh, yes, so motion passes five zero. All right, so we'll move on to item number nine. Uh, we have one public hearing uh, this evening, and that is the consideration of allowing health services as a conditional use on the ground floor on properties located in the Howard Avenue uh, mixed use district. And do we have Director Gardner? Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor and members of the council. And let me set up the screen here. And uh, so an application has been submitted to amend the zoning code and downtown specific plan to allow health services on the ground floor on properties located within the Howard mixed use district. And for uh, council consideration this evening is introduction of an ordinance amending uh, the zoning code to allow uh, ground floor health services in the Howard mixed use zone, as well as a resolution that would amend the downtown specific plan to uh, pretty much do the same thing, allow health services as, as either a permitted or conditional use on the ground floor in the Howard mixed use zone. Uh, this application originated with a proposal to renovate the existing property at 220 Primrose Road, the former anthropology store uh, for use as a dialysis center. Uh, the use is considered a health service and is currently only allowed as a permitted use above the first floor in the HMU district. Um, and health services are currently prohibited on the ground floor. Uh, therefore, an amendment to the zoning code and downtown specific plan would be required to allow health service uses on the ground floor. And although this request was made in conjunction with the proposed dialysis project at 220 Primrose Road, the requested amendment to the zoning code for downtown specific plan um, and the downtown specific plan to allow health services on the ground floor would apply to all properties within the HMU zone that spans the Howard Avenue corridor. It's basically this area in orange and I'll zoom in here. This is the, uh, this orange zone is the Howard mixed use zone. Um, and this is the approach that's been used by the city in the past when a code amendment uh, is proposed in conjunction with a project application. Uh, we don't want to, and we in fact cannot uh, change the zoning for an individual parcel, uh, but we can make, make amendments to the underlying 
zoning district. So in this case, it would apply to the Howard mixed use zone. Um, and one thing that uh, in this case, the zoning and specific plans um, would not apply to Burlingame Avenue in case there's any con uh, confusion. This pink area is, is known as the Burlingame Avenue uh, commercial zone. Um, and that is no changes are being proposed to that zone at this time. Uh, so what does the downtown specific plan say about the Howard mixed use district? I, I won't read through all this, but you know, the highlights are that there is a mix of uses. It's generally a broader mix of uses than we see on Burlingame Avenue. For example, it includes housing. Um, and then it does mention some language here about the side streets providing a connector, connection between Burlingame Avenue and Howard Avenue and really strengthening that relationship um, with, with commercial uses, creating that link. Uh, when the Planning Commission reviewed these applications, it was reviewing both the code amendment and the proposed dialysis center concurrently. Uh, so you will see much of the Planning Commission staff report uh, does concern the dialysis center and, and a lot of the details related to that. Uh, ultimately, the Planning Commission voted to not recommend the code amendment uh, and the main concerns cited by commissioners were related to uh, concerns with a lack of interface that a health service might have with the street frontage um, particularly as it balances privacy concerns with transparency of storefront windows uh, and also logistical challenges with providing adequate parking for uh, drop off uh, drop off of patients. Uh, because the Commission did not recommend the code amendment, it did not make a recommendation for the proposed dialysis center. Uh, so therefore the code amendment is being presented uh, only the code amendment is being presented to the Council at this time not the dialysis center project. Um, should the council support the code amendment uh, to allow the health services on the ground floor, the, the dialysis center application can be considered um, at a later date once the zoning amendment becomes effective. Um, one question that came from a council member was to ask which zones do currently allow health services on the ground floor, either as a permitted or a conditional use. So these next couple of slides provide a summary. Um, in the zones that are, it's allowed as a permitted use or what's sometimes called as of right, um, which means no conditional use permit, uh, Chapin Avenue commercial, Donnelly Avenue commercial, these are both in the downtown specific plan area, North Burlingame mixed use, which is up at the north end of town near Burlingame Plaza, uh, APN, which is the Anza Point North, um, that's the Burlingame Point area, and then the inner Bay Shore um, with a maximum of 5,000 square feet. In zones where health services are allowed on the ground floor as a conditional use, meaning the a conditional use permit is required, uh, the C1 zone, which is uh, general commercial, uh, the Bayswater mixed use, which is on the other side of the railroad tracks from um, the core of downtown, which uh, encompasses the part of downtown uh, close in to the Caltrain station. Same with Myrtle mixed use, that's uh, right next to that. Uh, the RRMU, which is the North Rollins Road mixed use with a maximum of 5,000 square feet. And then the Rollins Road district, the industrial part of Rollins Road also allows health services as a conditional use on the ground floor. So to summarize, uh, again, the, the two items that the council is looking at are the introduction of the ordinance amending the, uh, chapter 2533 and the resolution amending the downtown specific plan. Um, there have been some letters related to the proposed dialysis center and there are some speakers, I believe, who um, are ready to speak. Um, that could be useful in um, understanding how a health center use would uh, work in a, in a you know, particular circumstance. So uh, those speakers can, can address questions from the council. Um, but as mentioned, that particular project application um, should it move forward would be at a future date. And with that, that is the, uh, the extent of my presentation and I am available for questions. Thank you, Director Gardner. Um, I would like to thank you for having those last two slides. Um, I had um, sent an email earlier today to Director Gardner um, because I just wanted to know you know, what other areas in Burlingame do allow um, health uses? So I, I thank you for, for that clarification. 
Um, does anyone have questions? Council Member Beach. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just a question for Mr. Gardner. So um, obviously there was an application requesting this in Howard Mixey soon, but are there, is this a trend that you're seeing? Are there lots of requests for ground floor medical use where it doesn't currently exist, particularly in Howard, but in other areas of the city? We, and I'm, and I'm, I appreciate the mayor's question that helped us understand where it is allowed. Thank you. Certainly, um, we're not seeing uh, a lot of requests for this type of application. This, this is an applicant uh, initiated code amendment. Uh, we have seen some sort of hybrid retail health service uses such as uh, Warby Parker is an example where it's a retailer selling glasses with a on-site optician uh, providing health service uses. Uh, some of the um, skin and laser uh, uh, operations have a retail and a health service component. So we do see some of these hybrid um, where there is a, a retail component, but we have not seen um, anything where it's it's really a purely health center use, health service use uh, that's proposed for a ground floor space in downtown. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, if not, um, oops, sorry, Vice Mayor Ortiz. Let me try it, let me try it again. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, director, is uh, any distinction between different types of medical uses? I mean, I, you talk about uh, the uh, op optometry and that doesn't seem to, when I, when I think of uh, dialysis, I think of the, the very different operation than an optometrist. Uh, and in particularly the way it looks like from outside, because I'm assuming there's a lot of privacy issues with dialysis that need that requires the windows to be tinted and and there's really no windows to look through. So is there any distinction between the different medical uses or is it just one and the same? Generally, as a land use, it, it's considered one and the same, um, but kind of tracking the discussion through the, the planning commission. Initially, the proposal was to allow the health service as a permitted use, which would be consistent with uh, how it's set up on the upper floors. The planning commission, um, particularly those who were uh, more inclined to support the, the concept, thought that a conditional use permit made more sense in that it could distinguish between the particular characteristics of different uses because Health services, a very broad range of, of types of businesses, a CUP would allow uh, that, that kind of conditioning and customization of they're not all one size fits all, whereas, you know, retailers and even restaurants tend to have much, you know, more in common than, than the differences. So uh, that's how the CUP ended up uh, becoming part of this proposal. Excellent. Thank you. Council Member Brownrick. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I confess I read the minutes, but did not have a chance to listen to the dialogue at Planning Commission. I wish I had had the time. Um, did the question of whether uh, retail could be put in front, um, you know, in terms of a sort of shallow 25 foot drop before you got to the uh, clinic, if you will, did that get explored at all in this or is it all or nothing? So I'm trying to think it, you know, if it did come up, I, um, I I think the nature of a dialysis center is that there is not a retail component. Um, certainly, the um, you know the, the 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 applicants may be I, able to correct me on that. It, no, well, if I may, uh, Mr. Gardner, it, I understand that you know it's not like there's dialysis retail, but whether the building could be split in some function in some fashion and create an entirely different use that would be more pedestrian friendly up front was Understood. that explored? Uh, no, so that, that was not, uh, there was a lot of discussion on what could be done to make uh, the dialysis center use look approachable and, and fit in and what kinds of, you know, what could be done for the waiting room and such. Um, but there was not a discussion of, of creating, as you describe a, a sort of front retail use with with the um, health service use in the rear. Thank you. Okay, uh, before I open up to public comment, I do have a process question for a city attorney. Does everyone get three minutes? 
on this uh, or does a gentleman who brought this to our attention get more time? Um, that's up to the discretion of the chair. Um, if um, the, as the applicant, the uh, chair may allow some additional time for the presentation, um, but um, the chair can also decide that the applicant gets three minutes, just like any other member of the public. Okay, thank you. Um, so is the applicant present? So I do see in the list of attendees, uh, Becky Garland has raised her hand, I believe. And then- uh, Yeah, I see Kirk. From Woodstock has also raised his hand. So- All uh, right. Um, so what I'm going to do is, we're talking about a zoning issue, not necessarily the project. So I will give five minutes for one presenter um, on the zoning issue. And then everyone else from the public will have three minutes. And then um, Megan, if you can time it, please. Sure. sure. Great, thank you. All right, um, so let's start with who will be presenting? Will it be Kirk? Excuse me, Madam Mayor, do you need a motion to um, introduce the ordinance? Oh yeah, my apologies, yes. Let's go I'm happy that. to make that motion for you. Go ahead. Um, I make a motion to uh, introduce the ordinance uh, and waive further reading. Can I, can I ask a point of order? Read that first. Uh, it, in, let's, in, let's go through the introduction first of the ordinance since it's already started and then you can make your comment after. So do I, so um, council member Beach has made the motion. Is there a second? Second. All right, at least now the motion has a first and, and a second. So council member Brownrigg. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So a comment on the motion. In as much as we're being asked tonight whether to introduce the ordinance, that is the threshold question. I would submit that voting to introduce the ordinance is putting the cart before the horse. And I'm happy to go through the process at the end of the session, but as I understand tonight's work, we're, we're trying to determine whether we should do this at all. So I, I'm not sure I see, I mean, I realize maybe this is a point of semantics, but I feel like if we've introduced it, in a sense, we've endorsed it. And I look forward to the conversation before making any decision like that. But we're just introducing it. We're not voting on it per se. It's just an introduction. It's not voting yes that we are going to approve uh, a health zoning or or not. Is that correct, City Attorney? That's, that's correct. You're what you're voting on. the The motion on the on the table right now is to waive further reading of the of the ordinance itself. Um, so, if and, you do not waive, I, I guess the alternative and introduce right. Wave and introduce. That's wave how and we're, yeah. correct. Wave and introduce. just introducing. That's correct. Wave and introduce. So you're correct, uh, Councilmember Brownrigg, that if the motion that is on the table carries, then uh, the effect of that is that uh, you do not have to, we do not have to read the entire ordinance into the record, and the council has introduced the first reading of the ordinance. But this comes back to us at a later time, correct? Correct. And that's really when that final vote comes into play. But, okay, correct. So I'm sorry, I, that, that makes it really interesting for me now because so what we're saying is there's not going to be any further vote tonight once we vote on this right now. You have two actions in front of you tonight. One of them is to introduce the first reading of the ordinance to amend the municipal code regarding the zoning regulations. And then the second item is to uh, potentially adopt a resolution to amend your specific plan. So uh, the council is being asked to, to consider two actions. If you, um, so if you uh, um, adopt the first reading, um, then you would consider the second reading of the ordinance at a at your following council meeting. As for the resolution, you would only take one vote on that tonight. So, so, so 
but so so that I'm clear. So we're having discussion after we've voted to introduce it. That's uh, that's correct. And so okay. if there is a concern about considering the ordinance and, and voting on the ordinance before you've had the presentation, what the council can do at this juncture is we have a motion in a second, so that's there. You can delay the vote on the introduction and reading of the ordinance until after you've had the inter after you've had the presentation and the public comment. So then to clarify, then there isn't a second vote this evening in regards to the resolution itself, and that would really determine whether or not we move forward with this or not, correct? Correct. There's only one vote on the resolution um, to amend the specific plan. Which that is, actually happens at the next meeting if you were to bring the ordinance back, right? Isn't that what it says in the staff report, that it goes with the adoption of the ordinance? That's typically what we do because it is this two-step process. Um, but yeah, so I, I uh, although we, we have the resolution um, shown here for, uh, so that it's clear what the package is. Yeah, the, typically the resolution comes back for the vote at the same time as the ordinance. Okay, so then I can see why this is confusing because I, I thought we'd be making two votes. One just to introduce so we can hear it and then the, the, the second thing would be voting on the resolution itself after the hearing. So due to that fact, we may wanna look at this a little differently. So usually what happens at these is that we do, uh, we waive, you have me read it, the title, right. we waive further reading and introduce it. You guys have a discussion, ask questions of the applicant. It goes into the public hearing. And then at the end of the public hearing, we do another motion where you ask me to bring it back. You ask me to notice it and bring it back at the next meeting for adoption. So you're getting that question period in and then you can vote on whether you want it to be brought back for consideration of adoption. So then, and not to jump too far ahead, but let's just say the council would doesn't want it, then doesn't give you that permission, city clerk, then that means that motion would be dead tonight. Correct. Okay. So we actually can then go forward, introduce, way further reading, open the public comment, and then close the public comment. We discuss and then decide whether or not it comes back or not. And if it doesn't come back, that basically says the motion's dead. Right. Okay. Is my colleagues okay with this now? I appreciate council member Brownrigg actually bringing this up because I can see why this is confusing. And if I may, Madam Mayor, although uh, Councilman Beach has had her hand up that in front of me, but I, I would like to make a quick comment. Yeah, let me continue with council member Brownrigg since you started and then I'll go to council member Beach. So, so to me, I, I find this to be a difficult question. I've read a lot, I've thought a lot. I look forward to the conversation tonight. Um, I'm really not sure how I feel about this particular question. And I look forward very much to the testimony. I am not going to vote to support the motion because I just feel almost from a parliamentary point of view that our decision tonight is whether to introduce. And therefore we could have a conversation about this, not unlike the planning commissions. And the, at the end of it, then a motion could be made to introduce if that was in it, you know, an interest. We, I don't, I mean, if we have to have a motion to waive further reading so that poor Megan doesn't have to read the entire thing, I guess I understand that part, but I'm, I'm not going to vote to support introducing it because I, I haven't heard the testimony. So that will be my vote tonight on this if we go forward right now. Council Member Beach. Thank you. I appreciate the dialogue. My, my only intent was to uh, propose the motion was to follow the procedure in the staff report as we've done before, which you know, before a public hearing, we have the city clerk read it. It's really not to, t I, I, there was no other intent. And so um, I appreciate our city clerk's clarification on that. I'm happy to withdraw the motion if um, staff recommends that that would be um, suggesting that we have an intent 
going into the public hearing, but my thought was prior, what we do is read it before we have a public hearing. That was my intent for it. So um, appreciate the mayor and staff's guidance on that. Council member Coulson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, I am, I am trying to break this down in my own mind and have come up with, it's almost like a, I feel like it's almost a study session discussion at the bigger issue during which we would make a decision to say, yes, let's take that on as an ordinance. So for me, I would prefer to have more of a, um, of a, of that kind of lead in. And then there's the zoning question. And then there's the specific uh, project proposal question. And I think for me, the problem I'm having is I'm feeling like the project proposal is the proverbial tail and it's wagging the dog. And I'm not happy with that. I'd really like to deal with the big issue of the dog and then figure out what to do with the tail. Okay, so what we can do through our city attorney, and please correct me if I'm wrong, we can actually skip this part right now and then yes. just and just go right into the public comment, get the public comment, and then we'll have our discussion after that. That's correct, Madam Mayor, yes. Okay, so let's do that. All right, so Thank back you. to my question of who will be doing the presentation. Can someone speak up so I have some direction? I think it may be Kirk, but I'm not 100% sure. Oh, okay, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor and Council and uh, Director Gardner. So we're, we're gonna be operating a little bit on the fly here, um, given a little pivot in, um, in maybe the uh, objective here uh, this evening, but um, it, it, it seems that, uh, that, that tonight uh, is uh, tonight's subject is whether um, we thought was whether to allow health services at a, as a permitted or conditional use on the ground floor in HMU. Um, but, um, but that's okay. Uh, as, as, as uh, Director Gardner mentioned, if, if you decide to approve health services um, as a permitted, either permitted or conditional use in the HMU, we will be back uh, um, Woodstock Development um, will be back on behalf of Devita Medical for uh, for the application for occupancy at that 220 Primrose Road. Uh, as you all probably know, that building was the former Anthropology Building, which has been vacant for um, for over three years. Um, one thing to note, uh, you know, you you should have received uh, over the last few days, uh, some letters. We got copies of, of letters from a couple of uh, commercial uh, retail brokers in the area and from a Burlingame uh, merchant um, in support of the medical use in, in the building. But, uh, but maybe uh, this evening it would be better for you to hear uh, directly from uh, Davida um, about their use. Um, and maybe there'll be some back and forth on this, uh, depending on how uh, how complete you think their you know their their presentation is about uh, about their use. But uh, so joined, uh, uh, we have joining with us three representatives from Davida. Uh, we have Becky Garland, who's uh, the director of operations. Uh, we have Don Kenyon, Davida's architect, and we have Dr. Robert Sang, who is uh, chief medical. Uh, director at, at Davida. So um, I'm going to turn it over to them and hoping that um, that this will encourage some, you know, well, they will give a presentation, maybe encourage some, some dialogue. So thank you very much. So as we move forward, then um, I, I want just one main presentation that will be the five minutes and then everyone else after the next speaker will be three minutes. Okay. So if we can determine who would like to take the five minute position. If, uh, if Be Becky uh, Garland should be on as well. She's okay. on a separate, separate connection. Very She's good. On. Thank you very much, uh, Kirk. So Ms. Garland. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Um, um, thank you all for having us here today. Um, I, I want to provide just a little bit of background on DaVita. Um, DaVita, which means to give life 
is about giving life, enriching lives of our patients, teammates, partners, and the communities in which we operate. And so we provide dialysis services in the Burlingame area, as well as uh, across the Bay Area and on the peninsula. And we provide dialysis surveys actually to several thousand patients across the world in over in 10 different, uh, sorry, 10 countries outside of the United States. And we have several patients who we currently treat who are Burlingame residents. We have about 15 patients who reside in Burlingame and many who reside in the community immediately surrounding Mark Burlingame as well. And so the reason that we are here today is because um, we are at a bit of a crossroads where we have, to, um, we have to create a new clinic to be able to relocate one of our current clinics that is no longer able to um, continue due to a dead end lease. And so it has really forced the issue and we want to be able to continue to provide access to care and to also provide a continuum of care um, to these patients who require this life-saving treatment. So as a bit of background on dialysis, um, patients on average come to treatment dialysis three days a week for three to five hours at a time for the rest of their lives. Um, and so we provide a quite necessary um, good to the community, to the patients specifically and their families. Um, and so what we are requesting is, um, is to be able to operate in the immediate Burlingame uh, community, to be able to continue to treat these patients who receive life-saving care. Um, and in particular, um, I wanna talk a little bit about why this location is so important in and of itself. So as I mentioned, we have high patient demand for patients who live nearby. Um, this location also provides public trans, is really near public transportation and amenities, which are really critical for our patients, our teammates, and the physicians who operate within this space. Um, the medical space has blended with traditional retail and that the customers demand to be near other amenities as well as easy access to that transportation. The size of the building is also an ideal size with 10,000 square feet um, and all in a single story. It is difficult to find a similar sized um, building in a commercial area that's on one story, which is the requirement for our very complex water system. Um, this, this site also allows for patient drop up and drop off and pick up. Um, which will be easy. We have yellow loading zone stall that's been proposed in the front of the building and patients throughout the day come in in a total of three shifts, starting at 5 a.m., 8.30 a.m., 1 p.m. And the average patient will stay at the facility between three to five hours. So if you think about the flow of the day, and I know that there were questions in the previous meetings that we had, so I wanna just clarify those up front. We have about four to five patients who share the same treatment start time at any one time. Of those four to five patients, 40% approximately are driven by their family, 30% are self-driven, and 30% are driven by a third party company. And so these patient start times are separated by 15 minute intervals and the parking requirements and the traffic that you would expect would be consistent with what a second floor medical office would entail. So there shouldn't be any additional um, considerations, this being a first floor from a traffic perspective. Moreover, any traffic, and we expect it to be limited given that there are only four or five patients who start at any one time, but any additional traffic that would be caused between shifts would likely be considered off cycle, giving capacity to surrounding establishments during their typically high traffic times, which would be re during regular meal times. So this would, be, this would be a bit separate from that. Um, I would like to also offer some time after this, if possible, for Dr. Singh to speak uh, as a community member in terms of the benefits that this would provide to the local community and why this site in particular is so critical um, and to be able to use this for medical purposes. Great, thank you, Ms. Garland. Uh, so let's have Dr. Singh. Hello, hi, uh, uh, my name is Dr. Robert. Uh, you just muted yourself. You wanna unmute, please? 
Sorry about that. Um, there you go. Madam Mayor, hello. Uh, greetings, uh, Vice Mayor and uh, City Council members of Burlingame. Thank you for having me here. Uh, first of all, um, I wanted to clarify my introduction. I'm not part of DaVita. I know that someone mentioned something about being chief medical executive. Uh, I'm just a community uh, nephrologist uh, in the Mid Peninsula area. And uh, I serve uh, our Mid Peninsula patients, uh, including uh, being credentialed at the Mills Peninsula Medical Center for the last 15 years. I've had the um, privilege of uh, taking care of uh, patients with chronic kidney disease including uh, folks that you know, need dialysis because they have end-stage renal disease in the community. And um, I heard from Davida that the, there are a couple units in the area that serve our community. Uh, one in San Mateo is uh, going to ultimately close. And um, I became concerned about it because uh, my patients um, need to have a location that's close to, you know, they're typically elderly, um, they um, are. They have multiple medical issues, and and traveling far for three times a week hemodialysis is a is a, a big burden to to most of my patients. Um, so uh, when uh, this location was brought up uh, to my attention, I thought it was an excellent uh, uh, location uh, in terms of centrality to uh, the patients that I take care of, but also the public transportation, the uh, ease of uh, both uh, major throughway and, and highway access if needed. Uh, the patients I take care of are, are in Burlingame, uh, San Mateo, um, Foster City, uh, you know, even Hillsboro. And, um, you know, I think it would be very difficult for them uh, if say uh, I didn't uh, have a choice to send them to a local unit to go to say San Bruno or, um, you know, below 92 to, either uh, San Mateo, San Carlos, that would be a, a big burden for them. And uh, because essentially, if, if we don't have enough capacity for, for the patients in our community uh, that need renal replacement therapy, dialysis, then, then they would have to travel far. It would be become like a dialysis desert. And, and, and I, I think it would, uh, you know, just uh, I'm asking the council members to consider uh, our patients, the patients that are in the community that would have to travel afar to get their life-sustaining treatment. I also think from a you know, city standpoint, um, having a, a dialysis unit in a traditionally retail space is, is, is a good thing in the sense that there are people that come from outside Burlingame that will be there for uh, three times a week or you know, sometimes even four times a week, including family members. Uh, you know, the older patients uh, oftentimes have family members that take care of them and they have they need to go to places nearby uh, to to and shopping or eating uh, I think it would be great for the community uh, retail is very challenged also uh, and and I think that um, having multi-use is, is uh, I think reasonable for the community to to stay diversified uh, from the city standpoint but uh, I, I primarily want to ask you to think about uh, the patients that I take care of and, and others in the other nephrologists in the community that will be forced to send the patients in the community outside the community. And I, I'm asking you to really consider um, allowing us to have our patients stay in the community in such a central and, and nice location. Uh, for Madam Mayor, it's been four minutes. Would you like to let them continue? You're on mute. Dr. Singh, can you finish up, please? You know, in, in another sentence or two. Um, I, I think it's a win-win situation for both uh, patients, their family members, and uh, uh, the city of Burlingame to have uh, patients uh, and staff members to stay in the community. Uh, and, uh, so, so our patients won't have to travel far for their life-sustaining treatments. Great, thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, so I actually have a question, um, a little confusion. So I think when we had Miss Garland speak, she mentioned the lease at 1720 El Camino. Dr. Sang, you mentioned it was the dialysis center in San Mateo. So can we clarify which dialysis center it is? Ms. Garland? Yes, 
Yes, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sorry, I didn't realize that I was on mute. Absolutely. So the um, the dialysis center in Mills is the one that um, is going to be closing due to a dead end lease. The closest one is an El Camino Real in Burlingame, um, and and those will likely end up being consolidated into this central center that will be able to provide access to all patients. The okay. center in the south is, sorry, the center in the north, the one in Burlingame is not large enough to accommodate all of the patients who will be, who will need dialysis when the, the center in Mills is closed and the center is closing due to the dead end lease. All right. So as of now, the 1720s is still opened. And then you have, I know a few in South San Francisco, a few in San Bruno, Daly City, Foster City. So you have quite a few throughout the peninsula. So my next question is, what would be the average square footage of these centers? Um, I do not know what the average square footage is I can get back to you that information. I think about 10,000 is, um, is, is about average likely. Um, we don't currently have a center in Foster City. Um, so these are the only two in the immediate area. Okay, so at least when I looked up and maybe the internet is wrong, but I was, I was looking to see where these centers are located and Foster City is mentioned. Yes, that's a that's an older center that has been closed previously. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, my next question is: I noticed, and, and I'm familiar with the dialysis. You know, usually four to five hours, three to four times a week. Um, I noticed the hours. Some of these centers are open like as early as five a.m. and close at nine p.m. So, what are you thinking would be for this? type of center in, in Burlingame? Yes, we would anticipate similar hours where the first patients may be put on around 5 a.m. Um, mm -hmm. And then the last patients will likely leave um, earlier. 9 p.m. is typically when all the staff has left. There may be a couple of staff members who are late to, to close up and close everything out for the day. Um, but we would anticipate that the, the majority of patients will likely have left between 6 and 7 p.m. Okay. And then it sounds like it's kind of divvied in regards to utilizing public transportation or third party or driving themselves. And I assume that is also due to going through dialysis where patients may um, experience fatigue, uh, dizziness, hypotension, uh, nauseousness, et cetera, correct? Absolutely. And we have a wide range of patients who vary in terms of their independence and their age and their condition. And so many who are, are able to drive themselves do so. And many have very involved family members or caregivers who drop them off as another option as well. All right. And then um, it, do you have any patients that come by ambulance? Um, we do have patients who come by like a paratransit some sort of ambulatory vehicle to help for patients who um, do not have, you know, the ability to walk. Um, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, those are my questions. So I'll go to my colleagues. Um, so just so the public knows, I'm just going to have my colleagues ask questions to the presenters. Once those questions have been asked, then I will um, ask for additional public comments. So I just want to make sure our community members know that I will, I will get to you. Um, so let me get back to my panelists. Let's start with Vice Mayor Ortiz, followed by Council Member uh, Beach. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I want to go back to something that Council Member Colson brought up earlier. Uh, we're spending an awful lot of time talking about the specifics of the DaVita uh, proposal versus the uh, merit of the zoning amendment. And I'm just concerned that uh, in my mind, they're not one of the same. And uh, I, I just like to spend a little more time talking about the zoning versus this specific project. And we could do that, Vice Mayor. I just thought it, since we do have them here this evening, I didn't want to waste time later on that at least the more information we have up front whether it's zoning or whether it's learning more about the health aspect um, of a particular usage, 
will also be helpful in making that decision, whatever that decision is. Uh, Council Member Beach. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I, uh, that was sort of the nature of my question. I'd just be curious if the city attorney could speak to our ability to deliberate on the particular use of, um, of uh, meaning the of the particular project based on the way this was noticed, do we have to keep to um, just the zoning issue of so, zoning use on the first floor? Right. So, what is on your agenda tonight for consideration is the legislation, not the particular application mm -hmm. for a particular medical use. In this case, a dialysis clinic. So, what you are uh, allowed to consider. Um, and eventually take action on is the amendment to the zoning ordinance um, and, um, and, and its application to medical uses generally. Um, you are not, uh, what is not on your agenda tonight is this particular applicant's application for a dialysis clinic at this location. Does that help clarify? Uh, or did that answer your question, council member? Yes, I have a lot of specific questions about the particular use and I really, I appreciate the mayor's great questions too. I, I had many of them as well. I'm just trying to figure out um, where, where, to, where to go with when we start to, um, if it's appropriate tonight to ask further questions on that. So I, I'm, I'm hearing the, um, the, applica the, the, the application for this particular use that is a dialysis clinic provides context, but, mm -hmm. it, uh, but you are being asked to consider amendments to the zoning ordinance that, that take place generally, as, uh, as Director Gardner had provided in his presentation. You're, you're being asked to consider medical uses uh, generally and not any one particular application or any one particular use. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. But it's okay to ask those questions of context of a health usage because that has to do with zoning. Right. You can you can you can ask context questions. Yeah. You but just understanding that that you're not acting on this particular application. Correct. Yeah. Um, and, and I just want to clarify the reason why I asked those questions is Director Gardner had mentioned there's a wide spectrum of health uses. So I just wanted to gain an understanding of a particular health use, not the project itself. Council member Brownrigg. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so well aware of the you know, ban on spot zoning and completely support it. It would not only be deeply unfair if cities did spot zoning, it would create ultimately planning chaos and, and ultimately it would lead to lowest common denominator uh, building because there would be no rules um, if everything can be sweet generous. So very much support that. My question is if we have to expand, if we choose to expand this use into the Howard mixed use area, what do we think um, as experts and staff is the appropriate amount of space one has to allow this expansion. In other words, are we talking about the entirety of the Howard mixed use so that we're not accused of spot zoning? Are we, you know, what is the boundary? And the reason I ask is a little thought experiment. Um, one understands the desire to fill the anthropology building. How would one feel, and I will note indirectly, this was a question somebody else posed to me, how would one feel about the new uh, retail space beneath the new office building on the, next to the town square being filled with uh, dialysis or any other medical use? You know, I mean, so how widely geographically do we expand, do we have to expand so as not to be accused of spot zoning? Director Gardner. Yeah, I can take a first pass at this and then uh, certainly others can chime in. Uh, it does not necessarily have to be the entire Howard mixed use zone. There should be some kind of logic. So it's not so specific in particular to uh, a given project or property so that it, it appears as spot zoning. 
Um, but for example, when, when the um, commercial recreation provisions were adopted for the Burlingame Avenue mixed use district, it was adopted just for the 1400 block. And there was a logic to that, that um, there was quite a bit of discussion that that block functions differently than the others. It's less retail oriented than maybe some of the others. So, so there was some kind of internal logic that, that uh, made sense. Um, so, you know, I, I, you know I, I wouldn't necessarily suggest limiting it to one street, you know, and just saying this is all about Primrose Road, um, you know, in a certain block that, that's getting pretty surgical, but um, it could be that it applies to side streets or to, you know, there, there could be some kind of logic, um, understanding that another project would come in and, and you want to be sure that that, that logic would work and, and um, seem like a rational approach um, as opposed to a, a sort of um, more uh, kind of circumventing or, or finding something that's, that's um, very particular to the project. And if I may ask one other question, since I have the microphone, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, how does staff propose, so in much of the downtown area, we have waived parking requirements for, for various um, historic and frankly, common sense reasons. Um, you know, I've read a lot of different health facility um, requests around the country as a result of this, and every single one of them comes with parking. So how do we think about creating parking requirements for a health use in our downtown area? I mean, how do we think about that? Uh, so it's not specific to this use, it's really any health use that I've read has, you know, fairly significant parking requirements. So there is a uh, parking ratio for health services. It is um, less intensive than, for example, restaurants. The restaurants are the most intensive uh, parking demand downtown, and those are exempt. Um, so the way, you know, in, in the interest of uh, providing flexibility for land uses, we've we've used that one to two hundred, which is the restaurant uh, parking ratio as the, the most intensive standard and then uses that are less intense or less demanding um, provided, you know, if they're, if they're less in terms of the parking demand, um, they don't have to provide the parking. Um, now that's maybe different than the actual um, requirements of patients. They, you know, the, the fact that the city may not require parking, um, is that going to actually work for the use? Um, there are some health service uses on second floors, such as One Medical, which also don't have parking. And um, to our understanding, we, you know, that seems to work. Um, otherwise, I don't think they would be here. Um, but again, that that gets back to the point of each each health service is not created equal, and and there may be some that really do need something like a yellow zone or on-site parking, and others, which are you know probably can do fine with patients parking down the street in a city parking lot. Thank you, I'll rest for now, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Brown Riggs. So if there aren't any questions, any additional questions, I am going to go back to public comment and only have uh, people talk that have not spoken before. Uh, so I will have Michael Heathcote. Please unmute yourself. I apologize if I raised my hand, that was by accident. Oh, okay. <laughs> Very good. Is there anyone else uh, from the public that would like to speak? Ms. Garland, I know I see your hand raised, but you've already um, spoken in regards to your presentation and have answered questions. All right, on that note, I'm gonna close the public comment. Um, Megan, do, do we get any emails? We did, we got one email in to public comment. Um, it's from Athen Rebalos. He, he says, I don't support the conditional use permit for Howard Avenue. I feel strongly that this will become a robust retail dining and entertainment district. It is not an appropriate area for a medical business of this type. We are fortunate in Burlingame to have a multi 
to have multiple areas with already appropriate zoning. Therefore, this request for a CUP should not be approved. Thank you, Megan. Okay, colleagues, I'm gonna open it up to discussion. Is there anyone who would like to start? Uh, Vice Mayor Ortiz? I'll be brave. Uh, I, 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 you know, I've really, really struggled with this. Uh, and I, you know, had long conversations about it and, and, and I'm really struggling. And when it comes down in my mind, is, is it, it really there's different different medical operations that should be and some that shouldn't be so to, to do a blanket approval for all medical uh on the ground floor in the uh, in this area doesn't make sense to me but having said that I, I do go back to we've had many discussions about the future of retail and what that does to a lot of our vacant spots in town and how we need to be creative about what we allow so that we don't have these vacancies and I'm fully aware and it makes a lot of sense to me, but there's just certain uses that don't make sense in certain locations. And for that reason, I think that we need to keep it as a, a CUP versus a, just a regular amendment. Um, that way we have the ability to make the distinction between the different types of medical group. And again, I go back to the optometrist. The optometrist could fit in a downtown area, could fit in an area like this, I'm not sure a, a, a um, dialysis clinic is the is the right operation to be right there uh, in this location. Again, I think about all the waste and all the the water. She said there's something com complex water systems. When I heard that, I said, "Ooh, something about that just doesn't sit right with me." So again, I would like to have the ability to have the distinction, uh, and for that reason, I would stick to the CUP uh, policy versus the um, the uh, permitted. So thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, I'm going to jump in and actually, um, to me, this is more, I, I in looking at the usage, um, I would not be in favor of a CUP or allowing health services. And I have a couple reasons. So one is Many years ago, as you uh, all are familiar, when we discussed the Safeway project, and I was a, an integral part of that Safeway project for many years. Um, initially, when that was proposed, the back of the store was to our downtown. And the big conversation amongst our community members was, it's not integrating itself to our downtown. And they wanted to really change the placement of that store. So there was more interaction between pedestrians and the use. And so that was done. Um, I think it's important to really have that pedestrian nexus. And when you look at health uses and we're looking at blanket health uses in general, there really isn't that nexus. Um, and that's why I was kind of asking a lot of questions in regards to a particular usage. I mean, there's, you know, the difference of, you know, a doctor's office, well visits going in and out. Optometrist where the majority of the storefront is retail. And then you have a chronic usage like dialysis, which is a completely different type of healthcare um, where, you know, you have a few people coming in, more than likely they're not going to be shopping in our retail uh, area during that time period. When we made these decisions for our downtown on the uses, it specifically states in our goals and policies to strengthen and enhance retail uses on side streets between Burlingame Avenue and Howard Avenue to create an expanded active retail area and enhance pedestrian activity. And that's, I think, the goal of our downtowns. Now, one of the reasons why I contacted Director Gardner today was, well, do we really have enough options for healthcare to be provided in our city? And we have more than enough. Um, and there are various areas that it is allowed that it's also close to public transportation. So to me, when it's allowed in areas such as um, 
the Bayswater mixed use, the Chapin Avenue commercial, the Donnelly Avenue commercial, the Myrtle Road mixed use, um, North Burlingame mixed use, the Rollins Road mixed use, the Rollins Road district, the Anza Point North, the inner Bay Shore. There are plenty of options. We only have two downtowns. And once you change zoning, there's no going back. And I know we're having some rough time with retail, but things go in cycles. And so I don't want to change something that we may regret later, especially when there's plenty of other options in the city that that use can be uh, utilized. And so, you know, on, on that note, um, I would be against this usage uh, in this area. Uh, Council Member Coulson. Thank you. Um, I think that when the downtown specific plan was developed um, almost 10 years ago, the participants in that plan and the work that was done in that plan were very thoughtful and did a really good job of outlining where and how things should lay out in to create a vibrant downtown. Therefore, I also am reluctant to make a change in this zoning because for one, I feel like it's being made to accommodate a specific request as opposed to an organic need for a larger change within an area. I also think that, and I understand that there are some leasing um, sometimes that, you know, there are some locations that are having a little bit more difficult time leasing, but I look to, for example, the Sur La Table space, which was immediately leased by a very lovely local business, home goods business that will provide sales tax for us. It provides pedestrian foot traffic. That is gonna end up being a wonderful anchor over there on Donnelly when the new apartments are built. And then we have the new um, Steelhead Brewery proposal that will activate and create a, a wonderful area there. And just getting that one great tenant in, um, while not easy, it was done and there is demand for this space. It's just sometimes not as easy to lease. You know, you have to work a little harder sometimes to lease these spaces. Um, I also am reminded of um, the situation that Millbury had where um, they wanted to have a church go into the large living spaces uh, center down there that anchored that mall. And after coming to the council over and over again and pressuring them to do this, there was no other possibility of anything that could be leased here. The council held their ground about needing retail, the sales tax, the other important vibrancy it did to anchor that mall. And within two weeks after de declining that, there was living spaces that came in. So I'm, I, I think these spaces can be leased. Um, I spoke to a number of the local retailers right on that street. Um, they all feel very strongly that should remain retail. Um, I also have an issue with the notion that we would potentially have to zone loading zones because there's lots of arguments that can be, be made for many businesses why they need loading zones. And medical, you know, sometimes just picking up flower arrangements, they could say, I need a loading zone. And I don't like having this sort of constant um, decision making and winners and losers about who are, are going to end up with um, space or no loading zones or, or more parking or less. And then finally, I'm, I'm mostly concerned. I'm also very concerned about um, the appearance of spot zoning or you know, if we were to do the whole district, I'm, I'm, I, I agree that, for example, the post office, this new beautiful town square and plaza and post office that we're developing would potentially be um, all subject to medical use. And I'm not 100% sure that that is a great use down there in that facility. So um, I thank Mr. Rebellos for his succinct and thoughtful comments um, and, I have to say, I agree with him. And I agree with the other retailers on that street that um, we should continue to work to increase the vibrancy of this area by working on our retail. And we should welcome medical uses in the 
many, many areas that they are currently zoned for throughout the city. Council Member Brownrick. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so I, I really have uh, wrestled with this. I, I want to note for the public record, this, you know, now that we're in this new hybrid system, we sometimes lose track of the emails that we've received beforehand. Uh, but uh, the council did receive several very thoughtful uh, pieces, both pro and con, in terms of this particular use. And I can assure the writers of those emails that we read them carefully and uh, they were each exceptionally well argued, which I appreciated. Um, you know, it isn't, uh, you know, on the one hand, the choice is not um, dialysis versus retail. Right now, the choice is dialysis versus an empty building. Um, and it is indisputable that that building has stayed empty for a very long time. I, I do think, though, to the mayor's point, and for that matter, Councilwoman Coulson's, that, you know, um, once you make this change, you can't go back. And once you make this change, you've opened up a significant additional geography to medical. And um, I note that, uh, not that this helps the current landowner, but I note that we have a beautiful big building at 225 California that is ideally situated for medical. And in fact, it's supposed to be medical where the medical is on the first, second and third floor um, with parking beneath. That strikes me as the way to do medical in your downtown. Um, so I am having a hard time believing that we should make a fundamental, what I believe to be a fundamental change to our downtown strategy because of a single application. I understand there has to be a change if you want to accommodate the single application but I'm having a hard time seeing the justification for making that switch. And then I, I guess I will close on this, which is not apropos of this application, but um, at our last meeting or perhaps the meeting before I suggested, and I think it was generally um, thought to be a good idea that we should redo our economic study of downtown that we last did in the downtown plan. And that might help us inform us a lot especially with respect to increasing pedestrian interest as we build the town square and have a new office building with, you know, um, tens, if not hundreds of um, new downtown uh, you know, uh, office workers. Um, and I think there are other changes that are afoot. So I, I think that it is time for this council and the planning commission to, be, to do a sort of holistic look at our downtown this many years after the downtown plan what's worked, what hasn't, what do we see changing? Uh, then Mayor Colson initiated the retail review for our, you know, our downtown that I think sort of kicked off that notion that maybe we need to think about the next generation. We certainly are alive to the comments made by many that you know, retail may be struggling. On the other hand, the data points of Anthem coming into Sur La Table and other you know, the green shoots of the economic recovery, which may turn out to be very robust. It feels to me like probably the wrong time to be taking commercial space offline or retail space offline. So for all of those reasons, I am skeptical about the need and particularly skeptical that we've done the homework to justify this kind of switch. And therefore I, although I wrestled with this because I would love to see that building activated I am not inclined to move forward tonight. Council Member Beach. No, I appreciate colleagues' comments and uh, the thoughtful deliberations. Um, I think um, the compelling things that I've heard tonight on, on both sides, and I appreciate hearing from members of the public on both sides of this, is there's not a huge demand for first floor medical at this time. Um, and we do, number two, have lots of places in the city where it does exist, even, even around. So I, I, I do concur with um, Council Member Brownrigg that, because um, I could envision, I could see a potential 
medical first floor use, maybe that would be convincing, but I'm not sure that there's a market demand right now. And I, I think um, if that becomes a need, we can revisit that if that becomes a groundswell of need um, in a thoughtful way, but it just seems a little premature to do that right now. If we were discussing, even if we were to do that, I think in listening, uh, I would have a lot of questions about whether or not a dialysis would be you know, the right use um, right in the heart of our downtown anyway, but that's another question for another day. But I think I, I do land um, with, with what sounds like the majority that we probably, at least at this moment in time, until further study or further market demands, um, keep things as they are. And then if in the future we need to consider allowing future, you know, ground uh, conditional use permit on the, on the first floor, let's be super thoughtful about it. So thank you. Thank you, Council Member Beach. So then on that note to our city attorney, um, do we need to make a motion or because we... So procedurally right now, right. Um, <laughs> so as a recap, procedurally uh, where we are right now is that um, there was a motion in a second um, to introduce, uh, to read by title only and introduce the ordinance. So you could either take a vote on that um, or can withdraw a second, or can we withdraw it? Or you could withdraw the motion. I'm hereby withdrawing my second. The maker of the motion withdraws the motion. Okay, so there is nothing for the council to act on then. Very good. Hey. All right. Um, thank you very much. That was a very good um, discussion, and I think we'll be doing. I think the economic development subcommittee is going to be moving forward with you know further studies in the area to really kind of determine, you know, what uses uh, will be important uh, to this community. Um, before we move forward, I see that Council Member Coulson has raised her hand. Yes, um, I see that um, Mr. San Filippo is our EDNH specialist is online with us. And my hope is that maybe our friends at DaVita will be able to connect with our economic development team in city staff. <laughs> work with them to try to find them an alternative location or help help them understand the districts, the buildings, the building owners, and maybe try to help the city to help facilitate. Because I do think we would like to keep this facility local if we can. Council Member Brownrick. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. I completely concur. I, I wanted to address uh, Dr. Chung, thank you very much for your comments. And I hope it's clear, this is absolutely not um, an anti-dialysis position. And we have every sympathy for people who have to um, get dialysis treatment. It's really a question about the strategy for downtown. And it's not even closing the door on this use ultimately. It's just a belief, I think now universally that we haven't done the homework to justify making such a fundamental switch for our whole downtown. Um, so I, I just kind of wanted to be clear about that. Um, and for that matter, to the landowner who we all respect and who is himself a local person, um, we would love to work with you to see the building activated and regret that in this particular case, we're not gonna move forward tonight, but not to say the process might not yield medical uses in the future, but we, I do think at least I feel the cart got put before the horse on this one. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Brownrigg. Uh, we will move forward to item 10. We have one staff report, uh, the approval of the revisions to the investment policy to uh, for fiscal year 2021-22, and we have Finance Director Augustine. Indeed, um, every year we have the city's investment uh, advisors, PFM Asset Management, review the city's investment policy and advise us as to any recommended revisions. Um, the city was aware of Senate Bill 998, which modified the California government code sections related to uh, the investment of public funds. It, it was effective January 1st, 2021, but there was nothing uh, in the bill that was so earth shattering that we would uh, immediately need to make revisions to the city's investment policy. But there are two uh, small changes that were sug uh, suggested by PFM. 
Uh, the, the largest change from SB 998, which is still fairly uh, inconsequential to the city, is the ability to invest up to 40% in commercial paper. Uh, we happen to have no uh, commercial paper in the city's portfolio at the current time, but since we are allowed that additional flexibility, should commercial paper provide a, a good uh, relative value for the city in the future? Uh, that is one change we can readily make to the policy. Um, the bill also provides um, a 10% limit on the combined investment of commercial paper and medium term notes of any single issuer. Uh, the city already has a, a narrower per issue uh, maximum of 5%, so no change is really needed there. Uh, but PFM did recommend that we delete the language in the policy that refers to the outstanding uh, commercial paper of any single issuer because that is not needed uh, for most particularly smaller governmental investors. Um, other aspects of Senate Bill 998 uh, didn't necessitate changes to the city policy, um, such as allowing local agencies to invest in securities backed by the U.S. government with zero or negative yields. Uh, that was not permitted prior to SB 998, but that provision is sort of indicative of uh, concerns that persisted early in the pandemic that negative interest rates uh, could be on the horizon. And as mentioned in PFM's memo, uh, this situation is not precluded in our investment policy. So again, no change is needed there. Uh, other changes uh, to the state code pertain only to um, Indian tribes. So, so just those two changes are recommended as shown um, in the red line policy attached to the staff report. Um, and, and I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Director Augustine. Uh, are there any questions before I open it up to public comment? Councilmember Beach. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Director Augustine, for the for the presentation um, and for the audit committee for working so closely with you on all this all this stuff. Um, you know, there's just my question is there's been a sort of growing awareness about socially responsible investing, and even the markets changed, and there's options like ESG is now a you know environmental, social, and governance um, investment strategies are you know there's there's options that you know are are possible out there. Is there any thought to weighing the pros and cons at that as we sort of review these investment policies? And I know Councilmember Brownrigg made a comment at our uh, our budget meeting about how we really do a good job of that sort of organically. But um, I'm just wondering if that's on the radar. I know we had maybe talked about reviewing that in the past. Thanks. Right. I, I, I think the reason that it, it's sort of working organically now is, uh, I should mention, our contract with PFM is a, a non-discretionary contract. Uh, so the city, uh, the city's finance director has to approve any trades recommended by PFM. Um, so even with that aside, yes, ESG um, investing was mentioned by the audit committee several years ago. Um, ESG investing in the public sector is, is still a bit of a rarity, uh, but there, there are some challenges to implementing such a policy. Uh, there's no single definition of ESG uh, or how to objectively um, be able to implement and apply ESG parameters, which may in and of themselves conflict with each other. Um, staff and PFM, though willing, also raise the possibility of additional costs associated with um, implementing um, and managing uh, an ESG policy. Um, but uh, in, in the past couple of years, PFM has developed uh, an ESG fixed income uh, investment solution for their clients. And um, it, it appears to be uh, pretty practical, uh, not very complicated, um, and very transparent. So uh, they've stated their availability to present uh, that approach to the audit committee uh, for their consideration. And so um, it, it just has not been the right time recently. We've had other uh, priorities in finance, but uh, the solution um, 
uh, would be customized to the city. It's, it's based on ESG risk ratings. Um, and um, so while some challenges still remain uh, in determining uh, which ESG parameters are uh, appropriate to the city of Birmingham, it has been greatly simplified, or we could also pursue other uh, investment advisors solutions um, because as I say, ESG has come a long way in the past couple of years uh, for even for governmental um, uh, portfolios. I, I appreciate that. I, I recognize it's very complex stuff, but that's that's been at least my understanding is that it's it has come all, it's on the radar and it's a little bit there's some practical ways to approach it. Thank you for that insight and and uh, appreciate appreciate the explanation. Thanks. Sure. Uh, Council Member Coulson. Um, I feel like some somehow or another I've become the finance person for every small committee on every organization organization throughout the county. And so um, you're good at um, it. both peninsula clean <laughs> energy, uh, peninsula clean energy and flood and sea level rise uh, resiliency district, we have um, some fairly large pools of capital to manage and we do use PFM. Um, but these are just fully discretionary. So in other words, PFM has the full discretion to manage them within our investment policy statements. And for I think an extra basis point or two, we have you can imagine for Peninsula Clean Energy, for example, it would be quite awkward for an energy, clean energy company to be owning like a bond in a, in not. But, but I, I also take, um, you know, the, the, there's a really, I'll try to find it. There's a couple of really interesting articles about this going on right now, which are things like, it is also some of the clean, some of the energy companies, the dirty energy companies, call it Chevron, um, for example, who are leading the way in some of the clean energy technology. And the, that, the definition of ESG has a variety of lenses from which it can be reviewed and looked. And so, um, you know, what is one person's E and S and G may not be another's. So I, I personally think the way we're doing it right now with Carol and her staff making um, you know, sensible investment decisions and monitoring it is probably the most practical and cost effective for us. Uh, if we ever move to a fully discretionary situation, we could always make a change at that point. But I do want you to know that on the other portfolios that we are running on behalf of the county agencies and governments, we have put ESG policies in place. Thanks, Council Member Colson. Uh, Council Member Brownrigg. So I, I appreciate Councilman Colson sharing that. And I think not on a high priority basis, but I would love to explore what that might mean uh, for Burlingame um, to at least look at their policy so we understand it. I think the reality um, to Councilwoman Beach's uh, point, obviously I do care about this. In fact, for the last 12 years, I've worked exactly in this space. So it, it means a lot to me. The fact is most of our capital is not discretionary. We have no control over what CalPERS might do or, you know, any number of other actors. Um, and so for me, because as I've said before, you know, where you invest does talk about your values. I've been very grateful to Director Augustine and her common sense approach uh, of the corp, especially the corporate paper that, she, that our city holds. And that's one reason I do make that comment when this comes up that, you know, I think our citizens can sleep easy in terms of the companies we're backing. I'd be happy to identify, to, you know, engage in a more, you know, sort of deeper discussion about this. But I also think given where we are right now and uh, the amount of the fraction of our actual capital that we control, I'm also content with the kind of ad hoc nature and the values that we have. I do promise that current director and any future director that I plan to keep reading those bonds <laughs> and making sure that I think they're okay. But for now, I'm okay with where we are. But I do, I do appreciate your question, Councilman Beach. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have to agree with uh, what uh, Council Member uh, Brownrigg and Council Member Colson said. Uh, it, it would be something nice to explore in the future, but I'm, I'm happy with the way it's being handled right now. 
Um, but I think it's a great question, uh, Council Member Beach, and I, I, yeah, I would support reviewing that going forward. Uh, and, and you know what, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we can just get Council Member Colson to copy the language off of one of the ones that she already did. So thank you for that. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, so now on, on that note, I am gonna open it up to public comments. Is there anyone in the public that would like to speak? If not, I am going to close the public comment. Uh, Megan, is there anyone that sent an email on this item? No, there are no emails. Okay, thank you. All right, so then on that note, do I, uh, is there someone that can make a motion for the approval of the revisions? I'd be happy to make, oh, go sorry. Ahead. No, no, uh, go ahead. After you. Oh, thank you. Motion to approve the revisions. Second. On the policy. Uh, motion made by Council Member uh, Coulson, seconded by Council Member Bronrick. Can we have a vote, please, uh, Megan? Council Member Beach? Yes. Council Member Coulson? Yes. Council Member Brownrick? Yes. Vice Mayor Ortiz? Yes. Mayor O'Brien? Yes. Motion, motion passes 5-0. All right, uh, item 11, Council Committee and Activities Reports and Announcements. Does anyone want to add anything? Okay, if not, future agenda items. All right, uh, we will move on to acknowledgements. I know of two this evening, and I think Council Member Coulson, I'll let you start. Fantastic. Um, I know we have two and I see um, one family member from the second. So I will go ahead and start with um, a person who I think all of us knew and was a dear friend to many, which is William um, Bill Crandall Jr. Who passed away his home on May 17th after a long battle with Parkinson's disease. He was surrounded by his family. Um, a little background about Bill. He was born um, in uh, June 19, 1965 in San Francisco, but lived most and lived most of his life in California. He did attend San Mateo High School in the class of 1983. He received his undergraduate degree from Princeton University. And he received a degree in public policy and was a member of Phi Beta Kappa. He attended the MIT, uh, he, at he then attended MIT where he received his MBA and a master's of science in computer science. Bill was an incredibly bright and intellectual man. He then went on to work at Hewlett Packard for almost 20 years and he led their global engineering and services department. Um, he served on the boards of Teach for America, Village Harvest and the Atkinson's Foundation. He was a strong supporter of Burlingame Public Schools. He and I became close friends after we spent about three years working together on uh, co-chairing uh, both a bond, a facilities bond and a parcel tax. And I'll never forget um, what an amazingly hard worker and committed person he was to public education. And on the date where we passed that first bond and how elated and happy he was with, regarding that work. Um, but most importantly, Bill, he was an inspiring and he was a very generous person. Everywhere he went, he attracted good people. Everyone could immediately sense his genuine warmth, his open heart, and his limitless curiosity. He always had a smile on his face, kept a positive and optimistic outlook in everything he did. He was a natural storyteller and loved a good dinner party. He also had a lifelong passion and love for traveling. And as we heard today at his service, um, was able to travel almost all over this big, large world with his family. And um, that was one of his passions in life. He is survived by his wife of 29 years, Karen, his children, Kyler and Catherine. He also had three brothers that lived um, locally here. So with that, um, I just want to have Bill remembered as one of the people in our closing this evening um, and thank his family and thank him for all the years of service to the city of Burlingame and we will all remember him and be grateful in our hearts for that work. Thank you, Council Member um, Coulson. I would like to close um, in acknowledgement of Archie Leonard Offield, also known as Duffy. Um, 
I would like to thank Mark Lucchese, who is on the line, who sent me um, some information to share on his close friend. And it looks like Dee is on the line and she is the wife of uh, Duffy. Archie Leonard III was named after his grandfather, who was Burlingame's first medical doctor, and his father, Archie II, who owned an insurance business located in the Offield building on Burlingame Avenue. Duffy was born on January 6, 1945, sorry, 1949, to Olive and Archie at St. Francis Hospital in San Francisco and named Archie Leonard Offield III. Duffy grew up in Burlingame. He lived in a home on Pepper Avenue, currently owned by Burlingame Council member Donna Coulson and her husband. Duffy attended Pershing Grammar School until it was closed. He finished grades three to five at McKinley and attended BIS for middle school. Upon graduation from middle school, he attended Burlingame High School. He played three major sports, football, basketball, and baseball. He was the first inductee into the Burlingame Hall of Fame. And after graduating from Burlingame High, Duffy attended CSM and transferred to Hayward State, now Cal State East Bay. It was during this time that he met his future wife, Diane, known to all as Dee Dee or just Dee. Uh, he would have been married 49 years this September. He had a very set office schedule. He would arrive at the office around 8.30 a.m. and stay until about 9.15. And at that time, he would go downstairs to the Copenhagen uh, Bakery, take his usual table, enjoying his morning coffee. Other regulars would sit down with him and they would solve all the world's problems, talk sports and politics. Duffy loved the rotary. He was a member since 1980, and his father, Archie, was the president in 1959 to 1960. The last year or so, Duffy wasn't attending much. He was not a big fan of Zoom meetings, tech apps, or tech in general, unless it was stock. He was still using a BlackBerry phone until about a year ago. He will definitely be missed. His humor and his unconditional loyalty will always be remembered. Council members, would anyone like to add any comments? Okay, uh, Council Member Beach. Thank you, condolences to Duffy's family. I didn't know him personally, but he was a fellow Rotarian and um, he will be very missed, I know, in our club. I did, however, I do appreciate um, both the mayor's comments on, on Duffy and, and Council Member Colson's uh, remembrances of, of Bill Crandall, who was a friend of mine as well for all he did. You couldn't help but be a friend of Bill if you worked um, and volunteered in the school district. So in those of us who are on council, many of us have done that. So Bill, um, that memorial service today was really one of the most touching services I've, I've been a part of. Um, he really was an extraordinary human being. And um, he, he was all the things that council member Colson said um, kind kept coming up calm i remember his calm even through chaotic storms working in the in the volunteer world and he was just really a, a wonderful friend and he will be missed and um, we lost him too soon we lo we lose all these folks too soon but thank you for the opportunity to just say a few words and remember bill who was a friend too thank you council member uh, beach uh, council member brown -Rig. Just to note that Burlingame really lost two stars in its firmament um, with both Duffy and Bill's passing, and they were united by having many, many characteristics, but one of which was extremely large and welcoming smiles, and I will never forget either one of them. Uh, and when I remember them, they will always have very large smiles on their faces, and I, I grieve for their families. Thank you, Council Member Brownrigg. Uh, Vice Mayor Ortiz. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I knew both individuals quite well. Um, uh, Bill and I were the only males on the executive board of BCE, so uh, we shared the few meetings. He was a wonderful human being. He was incredibly intelligent. 
and just did a fabulous job on that board. I, I can't say enough and really, really sad to see him go. My last memory of Duffy um, was at the uh, holiday party for the Rotary Club where uh, he was pouring eggnog and uh, he gave me a little uh, an extra spike in mine and uh, laughed about it. And But he just had the most wonderful sense of humor. Uh, I sat at the same table with him at the Rotary Club for years and and we just laughed and you know acted up and had a great time and again we'll miss him dearly he was a super human being so thank you for that madam mayor thank you vice mayor ortiz so let's take a few moments to acknowledge these wonderful two individuals from our Berlin game community Thank you all. And uh, just a reminder that um, our next council meeting will be on the 21st of uh, June at seven o'clock. So all of you have a wonderful evening. Good night. Good night all, thank you. See you Wednesday. What time is it in the East Coast? It's late. <laughs> <laughs> <Good> night, <Megan. laughs>